Hello and welcome to episode number 308 of the Board Game Barrage podcast, a podcast about board games, the latest hotness, and how to have fun with your friends even when you're losing. I am joined today by, believe it or not, my friends, Neelan and Mark. Speak. Hello. Hello. I don't believe it. (laughs) Which part? If it's the friend part, get the f*** out of here. (laughs) Today on the Board Game Barrage podcast... We are going to be bringing back the fan favorite draft. Mark, this is where you would add fanfare. Yeah, yeah, I got it. The draft. I'm on it. And Except I want it to be like the worst possible sound effect. Like just a a single clip of children cheering, like very obviously clip art sound. I love it. This is a high class operation. (laughs) Use the sounds of when I'm introduced at like a live panel, you know. Well, we want booing on this? <laughs> Mark. I want to be positive. Mark. Is what we wanted, I thought. We edited those out. <laughs> and many longtime listeners will remember that the draft comes with a way for you to win money. Uh, and something that I'm telling Mark and Neil in live, inflation has hit the world. So inflation has hit the prize amount. Excuse me? Wow. What? $100 not... we're giving no, away today. What? $100 okay. wow. to your Wait. favorite board game retailer of your choice. <laughs> Stay you know, tuned. I, okay, for... Kellett honestly has not uh, informed us of this. This is not a bit. This is <laughs> One a serious situation. $100. Okay. Are family and friends of the Board Game Barrage podcast eligible to win? Can they like... No, Mark. Stop. <laughs> okay. Stop inserting Roselle. She cannot win the money. <laughs> we are going to be drafting something different. We've ran out of the BGG Top 1000. We will be drafting games that we think will still be relevant in 10 years that have come out in the past three years. So 2021, 2022, 2023, each of us will give you five games and we'll all pontificate to each other about how important we think they will be 10 years from now in the hobby. But before we do that, we're going to talk about the games we have been playing, except only Neilan and Mark will because I haven't (laughs) been playing. (laughs) I've been working and working like a dog. You know what I mean? Bringing home the bacon. (laughs) That's right. Mark will be talking to us about London Second Edition, continuing his trend of playing games that no one cares about anymore. <laughs> and Neilan will talk to us about Spectral, a game I'm genuinely excited to hear about. So thank you, Neilan, for doing your homework appropriately. You're welcome. Mark, why don't you start us off? We'll start low so we can only go up. That's right. Uh, yeah, London it, Second Edition. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because yeah, after stepping up to the cutting edge of the latest hotness last record with. Kudna Aura, I realized I needed to get back in my lane and talk about something <laughs> a little bit older. It's funny you also mentioned this because it reminds me of something that just happened. I got a box of a couple of games that I was looking to review. And every time we get a box of games around my neck of the woods, Roselle, previously mentioned Roselle, she always says she hopes that this time there's going to be, quote unquote, some fun ones in there. She's always hoping for some fun <laughs> ones. And she, she's usually disappointed. She's more of a, like a light party game player, which I definitely like. But I have been skewing a little bit heavier and more concerningly for her, a little bit more historical bent mm-hmm. games recently. So like I said, she's usually disappointed. So Box of Games shows up. She wants to open it. And I'm telling her she's not going to be happy with what she finds. But I couldn't stop her. And so she opens it up. And it's a, it turns out to be a collection of three Civil War games. It's like Antioch 1863 <laughs> and Tetum 1862 and Gettysburg or something. Literally the games. And she, she pulls out these games. And she's like turning them over in her hands, like completely dumbfounded. <laughs> and she looks at the playtime. This is, I swear to God, this actually happened. She looked at the playtime and it re- she just reads it out loud. And the playtime reads, victory in three to six hours. And she's like, <laughs> victory in three to six hours? Like, she says, like, why are these people sending you these games? And, and then she says, this is what they think of you. <laughs> she just keeps being like, this is what they think of you. We both died laughing. It's hilarious. Anyway. That's great. So let's wheel the years back as I cover London 2nd Edition, which did come out a scant seven years ago uh, in 2017. But this is an updated version of the original edition of London, which came out in 2010. This is a game by the one and only Martin Wallace, and the 2nd Edition comes to us from Osprey Games. In London, you're playing as developers trying to rebuild the city after the Great Fire. You do this through playing cards 
in your Tableau and then running the resulting engines, but with some typical Wallace twists. So let's talk about how you play. What you're basically doing is you're building an engine in front of you by playing cards into as many stacks, or as I'm going to call them for the rest of this review, hops, in front of you as you want. Call back to earlier episode of the show. So you pay for the right to build a building by paying another card out of your hand of the same color as the building into a common discard pile. So for example, if I want to build a pink building card, I place that pink building into my tableau while discarding another pink building card from my hand into this common discard array. Another thing you can do on your turn is draw cards. And as you might expect, when you draw cards, you can draw them from a common face down pile or from the aforementioned common pool of discards. So you've got that thing where you're forced to discard cards to build up your engine. But when you discard cards, you're often discarding cards that you want or you want to keep your opponents from having, but there's no no choice and it's a, a decision you have to make. So let's talk a little bit more about the uh, tableau building, which again is the crux of the game. So you build as many buildings as you want into as many hops as you want in front of you until you take the run your engine action. When you do that, you run your entire tableau, activating every building in whatever you order you want. And then most of the time, this is going to involve flipping the building face down after you've taken the action assigned to it into their stack, meaning that you only activate most buildings once. So you might ask yourself, why not just build a really long array of cards, a really big tableau, and then activate them all at once? The answer is poverty. So for every hop that you've built in your tableau... You said that really happily, Mark. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to put a happy spin on it. Why don't we practice? Can thing. you say, say it with me? Poverty. Poverty. Sadness. Poverty. Sadness. Poverty. The answer. No, you can't say sadness. You just have to say poverty. Okay, I'm trying. Yeah, I was trying to get myself in the right headspace. Yeah, yeah, sad. You're sad. Your dog is dead. The answer, poverty. So for every hop you've built (laughs) into your tableau, switching gears, whether or not it has an active or a face down building, as many hops as you have, when you run your engine, you get a poverty cube. You also get a poverty cube for every unplayed card in your hand when you take that run your tableau action. You also get a poverty cube for every loan you've taken out because this is a Martin Wallace game. And of course, there's going to be loans in this game. Anyway, what that means in practice is if you build a tableau of seven buildings, you'll get at at minimum seven poverty cubes. And that happens every time you run your engine. You're going to run the seven card tableau. A lot of those cards are going to flip face down. You're going to have to take turns to rebuild them, taking the, the build action. But then when you run the tableau, you're always going to get seven, at least seven poverty cubes because you have built seven different hops in your engine. There are buildings that you can build that allow you to remove poverty. But the reason you want to avoid poverty in general is at the end of the game, all players compare the amount of poverty cubes they have. Whoever has the lowest gets to discard all of them. And then everyone else discards that many poverty cubes as well. And then the players who still have poverty cubes get an escalating amount of negative points. So, for example, if Kellen ends the game with seven poverty cubes, Neilan with 10, and I have 16, because Kellen has the fewest with seven, he gets to discard all of them. Neilan and I also discard the same amount that he just did, seven, leaving Neilan with three, leaving me with nine. And then we get, again, like an escalating amount of negative points depending on the number of poverty cubes you end the game with. So it's a game where you can accrue all the poverty you want. You can swim in poverty cubes if you want to as long as you're close to everyone else if one person is playing a very poverty cube lean game then you're forced to take that into account you keep doing that until the uh, common pool of cards runs out and whoever has scored the most points wins that's london it's a relatively fast game i think it says 45 to 60 in the box something like that and and i think that that's pretty accurate i like the game it is a very simple straightforward game to teach and to play Uh, you only have one of three actions i think that you can take you can either draw cards build that tableau or run it so it's very straightforward in terms of your choices but it is filled with, with difficult decisions again a little bit of that arboretum thing where every time you want to build a card you have to discard a card and you, you often will be regretting the cards you discard the poverty thing is interesting because again you can have a, a game where everybody's like going hell for leather and picks up a bunch of poverty cubes and everybody's okay with that and then you can get another game where you're really pushing your engine and, and gathering all, like, a lot of cubes. And then you realize that one of your opponents is going really low on poverty and then you're in trouble. So a, a lot of interesting things to, to think about. Again, a very straightforward game to play. I will say that it did feel like toward the end of the game, because you could tell when the game is going to end because, again, it's based on this common pool of cards. And you will often realize that 
it's not worth it toward the end to run your engine again to pick up all those poverty cubes because the game is so close to ending and you won't have a mechanism to remove them. And so in the couple of games that I recently just played with it, it did feel like at the end the game sort of fizzled at the end. It wasn't like a crescendo. It was more like a petering out. There's another aspect of the game where you can buy these, what are they called, burrows, which give you temporary powers that you can acquire. And that's an, a, kind of an interesting aspect to the game, which I liked. So all in all, a, a game I enjoyed. Some of the people I was playing with, they were a little less happy about the whole poverty cube part of it because they found it to be like a little bit first of all bummer just having this poverty thing currency that you have to concern yourself with but also it felt like a sort of like a a negative drag like people wanted to again and the way the tableaus work is like when you run your tableau it pretty much will always fall apart and just like be exhausted and you have to build it back up so you don't have that engine building like building to get stronger to get stronger to get stronger the cards are tiered so like the last set of cards are for victory points and tend to be cooler than the first ones but again you're always sort of like running it and then rebuilding running it and rebuilding so it's not an escalating sort of feeling to it but you know given that it's a 45 minute well-designed martin wallace game i'm willing to give it a break on that account but I, I definitely grant that it's not a game for everyone, but you know, for 45 minutes, I would say give it a shot for sure. So that is London Second Edition by Martin Wallace. And this edition, which I've never played the first edition of London, I, I hear there's quite a few changes for the better, almost universally for the better. So the edition that I played, Second Edition, is by Osprey Games. Is this like uh, the tableau reminds me of like a furnace kind of in some way, but how much yeah. heavier? Is this like four times as heavy as that? Because mm-hmm. you mentioned it's also quite short. Yeah, no, I would say it's heavier than Furnace, but not much. I wouldn't even, like, it's hard to quantify triple or double or quadruple, but I would say, I wouldn't even say it's, like, twice as heavy as Furnace. Maybe twice as heavy, but no more than that. It's not, it's so not a very heavy if game. if Furnace was a two, and we doubled it in heaviness. <laughs> right, so this is, you're saying this is a four is this, on the Is this hard to weight? quantify for you? Mm-hmm. I'm well, not sure I understand. No, what you okay. Mean. Well, let's quantify it then, Mr. Quantifier. Uh, well, no, let's not. If, let's not actually. If Furnace get into is a the two on the BGG scale, nah, and we're let's saying, not. <laughs> we're saying, London is like the one of the heaviest games ever, and I would say no. <laughs> but but if Furnace is like a one point five, I would say like on the BGG scale of weight, this is probably a low twos, two point one or something. I haven't looked at the number, but that's what my guess would be. It's quite light. It's on the lighter end of Wallace. <laughs> yes, it is on the lighter end of Wallace. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. That sounds fun. I yeah. would do that. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little multiplayer solitaire, though. Yes, except for that whole poverty thing. That forces you yeah. to keep your eyes open. And also for the discard thing. You're not really paying attention to what other people are looking for, but you know that you're giving them potentially good cards. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're, you're right. Cool. So I'm going to talk about Spectral. Uh, this is a new, just finished crowdfunding has just gone out to backers released from Bitewing Games and Ryan Courtney, who is most well known for Pipeline and Trailblazers. This is not anything in the vein of those two games at all. This is a, it's built as a deduction game. For whatever reason, there's been some discontent over that label in our Discord. I'll get to that in a little bit. But the gist of Spectral is that you have a team of treasure hunters. You're looking for gems while trying to avoid curses. You are going to be putting your treasure hunters between two rooms in order to peek at one of those cards, which will give you some information about where the gems and curses are in the mansion, and also effectively bidding on that space between those rooms. So at the end of the game, if you're next to gems, you're getting a share of those gems at the end. But if any of your treasure hunters are next to a curse at the end of the game, then they are first eliminated so you want to be avoiding being next to a curse at all costs while trying to get yourself next to the biggest caches of gems how does the system all work so there are four types of information card on the board and each of those cards will either point you to the location of gems or a curse there are four curse cards in the game and four types of information and it's important to know that each card is always pointing you to another room i'm not going to go through all of the rules for this but for example one might be talking about the room that is the mirror image opposite from the mansion so let's say i explore the top left card it is pointing to either, let's say, a gem or a curse in the bottom left of the mansion. So you're learning information about other rooms than the one you just explored. There are four different rules to determine where these are. Twelve of the cards point to gems. Four of them point to curses. And crucially, this works using sort of a bidding system. So anytime you place down your treasure hunters, you're choosing to either put down one or two or four or however many. And you can bump other players out of that spot by 
putting out more treasure hunters than them. They get their pieces back and use them on a future round and so on. And the game keeps going until usually someone runs out of treasure hunters. It could keep going until all players pass. That's never happened in my experience. But once one person has run out of treasure hunters, everyone takes one more turn and then you do the grand reveal. You flip up all of the cards. You put the note of where all the gems are, where all of the curses are, and you divide up the gems. One thing that's kind of neat about the dividing is it's not based on how many treasure hunters you have, but let's say that there are four spaces surrounding a room of gems and you occupy two of those spaces, you're going to get half of the share. So it's about occupying as much space around lucrative rooms as well as effectively using your treasure hunters to bid out other people. The deduction component of all of this comes into the fact that, you know, if you can imagine this as a notebook you have, and there are five notebooks included in the game, you're making pencil marks in your book to say, okay, this is the card I saw. That card is telling me that I now have found the specific card that tells me where a curse using this rule set is. Now, I now know that we're looking at row A, and I'm not going to go into all of the specifics of this, but that means I have some information on what the other cards in this row could be. So sort of the process of elimination, you can start to narrow down sort of speculatively on, okay, that means I now know that there are two gems pointing to this room. That's super, super lucrative. And the chances are that there's a curse nearby or maybe low because I happen to know there's a curse here, happens there's a curse here, and the two curses I don't know about probably won't be pointing to these specific rows. So there's like some inferences you can make. It's not especially profound. And that's the kind of thing where a lot of the criticism has come with this. It's, it kind of feels like a lot of the logic follows fairly naturally, but there's a good amount of risk assessment you can do through inference of like, okay, if there are two curses left, that's unlikely that there will be a curse here, but it might be worth it to get a, a share of these three gems. That's a very rare thing that might happen. You have three or more gems pointing at a single room. The thing I like about all of this is that it has that reveal at the end, that, that sort of moment where you flip it up and someone will be like, ah, oh, I didn't know about this curse over here. Or someone will say, oh, yeah, I knew about this room, but I knew that there was a curse next to it, so I couldn't get to it. It has that neat reveal. But by by the same token, there is the sense that you cannot possibly know all the information. If anyone ever knew all the information, the game functionally doesn't ever work. So there is some sense of just getting a little bit by oh i didn't know there was a curse there or i hadn't got the information to know about the things that you knew about and someone might end the game very quickly by uncovering a large amount of information in the couple of rounds so you know it, it's it's a little bit wonky it's a little bit kind of you still just have to meet it where it's at but as a process of that sort of note-taking deduction style of game it also has this fun interactive bidding mechanic I like this a heck of a lot. I think it's really great. It plays in about 20 minutes. It's fun. It's interactive. It's funny. It has that good final moment. I think this is super cool. All right. Question time, Neelan. Hit me. So there are a couple things. One, compare it to me to like Cursed Court. Because it's very comparable to Cursed Court. Okay. That was kind (laughs) of, well, yeah, what you were saying sort of sounded like Cursed Court, but like, for gamers with yeah. a Z on the end. I, I think like... that's and what's actually really funny. And I'm actually glad you mentioned that because uh, I had not made that connection in my head. And then I was describing this game to someone and then someone next to me was who had also played it before was said, it's basically Curse Court. And I'm like, oh yeah, it kind of is. Like, <laughs> and, and, you know, it, It's not exactly one-to-one, but it is that sense that you have some, there's no real shared information. I think that's the heart of Curse Court. But you're gaining information that is a subset of the information that other people have different subsets. And you're using that to kind of not necessarily bluff as much. I wouldn't say you do as much bluffing in a game of uh, Spectral. But you're using your share of the information to get one up on what you know based on positioning on, on other players. And then does it have sort of the same thing as Watson and Holmes where you're like, why is Neelan putting all of his pieces over there? And very like, I much want to so. go there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that tension of like, wait a minute, why is everyone over there? Exactly. And I think the thing that it does that's quite clever, and I think some people might criticize this even, is that there is value attached to your treasure hunters that you don't use. So you're not incentivized just to take 16 people and slap it down in the spot because each of those people is also worth a point if you have them at the end. So you have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how you're using your treasure hunters, especially as the game's drawing to a close. But it does still create those high tension moments of like, oh, wow, someone still had their ones and twos, but someone's put a four out like in the first couple of rounds. And like that feels like a big moment. And everyone's to figure out like why and you know is it worth outbidding someone just to find what's in that spot or it's like beat them to it it's great it's got little highs like that that i liked a whole lot that's really cool i really want to try this so what is the argument people are having as to what type of game it actually is you're mentioning discord 
Yeah, so the thing that keeps tripping a lot of people up is the idea of, like, what a deduction game is, right? Like, right. if you are peeking at a card and that card is giving you very specific information and then the only inferences you can make are by process of elimination or, okay, because I know this and, and therefore this logically follows, is that really a deduction game? I would argue that you would eliminate like almost a huge school of games that we call deduction games if you were right. to be that strict about it. And I think these people in particular are being spoiled by some of the better inference games like Cryptid in recent years, which, you know, are tip top of that style of game. But I think every deduction game has to very carefully gate how much you can extrapolate from a piece of information. Otherwise, you there would be just like a skill ceiling on it that would be impossible to climb. Right. Isn't that the same as what Cryptid does, though, where you're, like, looking at it, it can't be this, it can't be this, it can't be this. It's, like, process of elimination of, like, a thousand rules. Cryptid, I think, is quite smart. I- I've seen some people who very clearly know how to work through the logic in Cryptid in a way that, you know, even uh, I've not gotten to that point yet, you know? So, like, I-, I don't think Spectral allows you even to do that, really. Like, at best, the best I've gotten in the game of Spectral is, like, okay, based on where other people are placing, based on the information that they seem to know, and based on the curses that are left, I know that there cannot be a curse in this row. And that's, like, two steps of logic. Sure. But it's, like, everything in a game that you could deduce is built by the rules and the game that made Absolutely. it. So it's like, it's a weird criticism. I, I, I well, would agree. I, I, I would agree. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I, I think, is, you know, because even a game that, you know, something like Alchemists, like once you've played Alchemists enough, you know all the possible inferences you can make from any piece of information. So it's not like you're yeah. going through like a crazy innovative process every time you play that game. So yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of a weird distinction. But anyway, that is Spectral by Ryan Courtney and Bite Wing Games. And then the other thing, this is, you bought this game, correct? Yes. But they gave me a copy of this game as a review copy, so do we have to tell everyone that? Oh. We have a review copy of the game, yes. and this was not the review copy. This was not the, the review copy that I <laughs> We played. swear, we swear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us get right into the draft. For those who are new to the show, this is a series that we love, that the people love, where we are going to be drafting a games just like fantasy football in order. So we're going to be snake drafting. If Nealon gets the first pick, I'm not saying he gets the first pick because who could say? Then Nealon will pick, I will pick, Mark will pick, then Mark will pick again, then it'll go back to me, then to Nealon. We will each draft five games. And then you, the listeners, will vote on who has the best list of five games according to the criteria. One player who votes, one listener, will win a $100 gift card to the online retailer of your choice. Kellen, we should have saved this for something for the Patreon channel. This is cool. That's where we released the big bucks. People love money. (laughs) We released the big bucks for the patrons, though. $100, Mark. It's true. You're right. right. Do you Uh, you know how much it costs for one Big Mac (laughs) in America? And we should say that if you want to vote, you should go to boardgamebarrage.com slash vote. All right. So the topic for today comes to us from Tom Vassell. Well, it comes because I watched a Tom Vassell video that was very inspiring to me, very interesting about the state of the hobby. He was talking about how there are over 5,000 games per year added to the BGG database. I think this was just for last year, but I'm extrapolating that out. Meaning in the last three years, there have been 15,000-ish board games that have come out. And the question I have, or the question that we have, is which games will be the most relevant 10 years from now? So we are going to draft games from the last three years, have a list of five each, and then you are going to vote on which list you think will still be relevant 10 years from now. What I love about this, what I love about this is that there will be a winner, right? We're going to know two weeks from now who had the best list, according to you, the listeners, but none of us know. And 10 years from now, (laughs) one of us is going to be vindicated. It could be me. I could have the one game that is still relevant 10 years from now. Mark, let me tell you, this is that long. Mark? Mark. Wait, me? Oh, he's gonna be. He he's won't be, be around by that. <laughs> me, I'm the most spry of the bunch. I want to be alive and kicking. What are you talking about? Oh, uh, that's a joke. I wish I had thought of. Um, <laughs> so, those are the rules. You can vote at boardgamebarrage.com/slash/vote. 
All right. How are we going to choose who goes first? Who wants the first pick in this draft? I mean, if we're just throwing it out there, I, I would not turn down the first pick. I would, I'd be happy with the first pick. If you guys don't oh, care. Oh, you're happy with the first pick. I, I'm just saying. I mean, Look we can randomize if you more. want. But if you're saying, I don't care, let's throw it out there, then I, I'll take it. But we can randomize it. I'm happy either way. I'm confident. We need to institute some bans, Neilan. Yeah, ooh, a ban system would be good, actually. A ban? Because there's like eight games that are qualified for this. Are you going to go ban system? <laughs> there's 15,000. Did you watch the Tom Vassell okay, video? All right. You could take, Fif- you, give me eight. You could take the other 14,900 and whatever. Yeah, you'll take the eight. No, I don't think we should do bans in this episode because then there will be the ban list would be selected by mm-hmm. like 90%. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> the listeners. I have ordained, I, the host, have ordained that it will go Mark, Nealon, Kellen, Kellen, Nealon, Mark. So I will end the snake and be the head of the snake. Mark, you will be the first pick in this new draft that we are doing. What games out of the last games released the last three years do you believe will still be relevant to the board game hobby 10 years from now when you will be dead? (laughs) When I'm long gone, (laughs) when I'm I'm long in the ground. Okay, I did not want the third pick. I feel like... interesting. There, yeah, are there, two, are two there are two standouts. So you f- me? Well, you f- yourself. You're the one who said it. You ordain, <laughs> Mr. Ordainer. So, yeah, I think there are two that I would really want. But of the two, I think there is one that I, I do want more than the rest. And that one All is right. a game that I personally have been playing a ton. And look, you talk about like how interesting it could be that a game that we we don't even maybe pick in this draft becomes actually 10 years. The one that is the best one or the one that holds up the most, like who can tell or who can say 10 years from now, which one is the best. This sort of mimics my relationship to the game that I'm going to pick because when this game first came out, I was ho hum on it. And since then it has only risen in my estimation and it truly, truly feels like a game that I could play. You know, I probably played it 15 times in the last year, if not more. And I, I, I still have not tired of it. And, you know, next time we do top 50, I think it'll rise again. And it's going to be Ark Nova. I think yeah. Ark Nova is the clear number one game for this list. So I'm, I'm picking Ark Nova from 2021. When is Ark Nova? Yeah. I, I think the thing that's interesting about Ark Nova as well is that it already has kind of like a classic feel to it. You know, it's... Yeah. it's because it's, it's the same game as Terraforming. Well, well, yeah, it, well that's kind of what I mean. I, I, I don't mean that to be derisive, honestly, but it feels like it's doing I a do. lot of stuff that a lot of other games have done before, but it's doing it particularly well with a theme that's very unarguable, uh, a theme that actually has broad appeal. Yeah, I think it's just a good, clean pick. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, the sort of picking a game from 2021 already has, you know, in the yeah. in the yeah. milieu of this hobby, things go up and they go down in a year. And so yeah. I think it already has some legs. So I, I, I agree. I think it's the definitive first pick. But I'm curious where we go from here, Neilan. There was another game that's as yes. almost as good. He did not want the third pick. So don't screw it up, Neilan. Yeah, I mean, I think that my head is at where Mark's head at, which is that the definitive second pick on this list is Dune Imperium Uprising. Yeah, I agree. I think that Dune Imperium, I mean, just by virtue of the number of expansions it's had, the fact that it already has this new version, it's very much on the up and up. The number of people I've seen that have been calling this one of the greatest games in recent memory, it's really impressive, like how well it's done for something that was effectively a Dune licensed game. I think it's excellent as well. I think it does also that very cool thing of feeling classic-y while also having an interactive element to it with a lot of player interaction in like the combats and, and all that jazz. It's good stuff. I love the Imperium. Yeah. Interesting. So um, my, my thing here, I think it's, uh, it is the second pick for me. The thing is, Dune Imperium does not qualify because it's one year too old, but I don't know if I even would have picked it if it was up for picking so that's the, the thing that made me a little concerned about it because like if i liked dune premium so much well, i think it's a fantastic game but i wouldn't have picked its predecessor what does that mean about where i think it's going to be 10 years from now i still think it's again the second strongest pick but I, that's that's what knocked it off a little bit for me yeah i think you know you also given their track record you're going to get dune imperium the third edition in another year and a half <laughs> right <laughs> that it could be the definitive edition and then neilan where will you be 10 exactly. years when I say I told you so? <laughs> At least you'll be alive for that I told you so. Okay, with the third pick of the draft, remember I get two picks. I think the third pick is actually also fairly easy, which is surprising, Mark. I, I think maybe a cliff drop-off, but the 45th highest-ranked game on Board Game Geek 
Very light, so not as popular with the voters, but but Cascadia, incredibly popular, available in Target. One of the sort of pushers of the cute animals on the cover, we're going to make nature-themed games. Absolutely amazing art from Beth Sobel. Mm -hmm. Is that how you say your name? Beth Sobel. This one is, and and it's actually a good game, right? Like that's great. that's what makes it work, is that it has that mass market appeal, but it is still fun for gamers. Again, I don't know, like like, like there's this the idea that like these lighter games, I think that in general, right, lighter games are more likely to be relevant ten years from now. Uh, what do you think about that as a hypothesis? I think that's correct. I think so. It would have to somehow get to the masses. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's just like my, I, I, you know, yeah, how many sticker. games? I don't know. I think, there is, I think there is a lot question. of truth in that. And honestly, I think that one of the things that is very interesting about going down some of these lists is, is some of the big hitters that are heavier games don't get the traction just because they are heavier games. Yeah. All right. And then my second pick, just because this was easily like I was contemplating taking it in the first round. Well, and here we are at the beginning of the second round. This is Blood on the Clock Tower. Yeah. I think that The Resistance, right, came out in 2009. And The Resistance was very trendy, important, as part of Avalon, to be fair. But I do think Blood on the Clock Tower will likely get more content up until Blood on the Clock Tower came out. And now people are like, Whoa, who wants to play Resistance when we could play Blood on the Clock Tower? The groundswell of support for this game... The amount of people outside the hobby that have asked me, have you ever heard of this game? They're like, it's so large. Like, I've had more than one coworker ask if I knew how to play this game. And, like, I find that, like, fascinating. Again, I work in video gaming. So, again, I'm not going to say that everyone in the world wants to play Blood on the Clock Tower. But I will say that from the groundswell of support, the community that exists with this game... Again, I'm a little nervous, a little nervous about my list, which is Cascadia and Blood on the Clock Tower. But again, we're not voting for a collection here necessarily. We're voting for who has the most games that are going to be relevant to the hobby 10 years from now. I think Blood on the Clock Tower is boom. Yeah, I think that's a great pick. Full transparency, I would have picked it next. It's not even your turn to pick, right? It oh, no, is it is your now. turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am going to... There was a hope against hope that it wasn't going to be your second pick, but I will pivot to Heat Pedal to the Metal. I think that this is a truly excellent game. I think it's one that is very accessible, one that I have found I have enjoyed more and more. It has... Hidden Depth is maybe overstating a little bit, but I do think that there is a tendency for people to understate how clever the heat mechanic as a resource is and how effectively you can use that, especially in multiple lap races. I like this a lot. It's I find it more and more rewarding the more I play it. I play it a fair bit than BGA at this point. And I do think it just has that... There's something that's special about race games. I, I think that there is just something that is very easy to like explain to someone like, hey, you got to cross the line first and here is your simple hand of cards that allows you to do it. I think I've seen this just be on the up and up. There's an expansion coming out very soon. Yeah, that's it. Heat pedals the metal. I think that we're going to be mocking the shit out of each other's lists very quickly. Yes. But like, I, I cannot overstate how much I disagree on Heat. Like... It's the exact same conversation that everyone was talking about Flam Rouge, like it was the second coming of Jesus, and like <laughs> no one talks about Flam Rouge. I, I don't. I think it's a dramatically better game than Flam Rouge, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I do I, think it's going to have the longevity, personally. It's indistinguishable. From Flam Rouge. <laughs> that is not Except simply it's about not cars. True. Simply not true. Yeah, you're you're factually wrong. <laughs> I can't tell the difference between the covers, Neil. And you're telling me that well, that's my problem? Okay. I already feel like I'm sort of out to sea here because I think we are now in a potentially uh, difficult place to choose. And you're only on your – what, is this your second? It's only on my second, pick? yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you guys feel like you have a robust list left over, but I'm, I'm already Very like robust. a little concerned here. I know. See, okay, so I know one of my picks, but the problem is I don't want to pick it next. Order of it's operation – Order of operation, yeah, matters a little bit here. It's not so much a flyer. I'll explain why in a second. Let me see. Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm already feeling like I'm super gambling here. but uh, Just okay. believe in it. I believe know? in it. I believe in it. Okay. I think, as you said, there is definitely something to the getting lighter games, games that people can play you know, whenever and appeal to a larger swath of, of folks. But I think... 
I think the pool of games that could last the test of time that also fall into like the the quicker, shorter, more accessible games is pretty shallow. So I'm going to take the one that I think rises above. I'm going to go with Sea Salt and Paper. Interesting. I think of the of the remaining lighter card games, it's the one that I think has the best chance of being something that people play in the future. I know it's a, a little bit of a, a gamble here, but I don't want to know many people who, when they play Seed and Salt Paper, either don't like it or are done with it and just want to play it once and move on. Like It seems to be a game that people want to play over and over once they've played it once. So I'm going to go with Seed Salt and Paper, a little bit of a gamble. And with my next pick, I'm going to go with a game that I cannot let go because it's not going to get back to me and one that needs to get snatched up here. So I'm going to go John Company 2nd Edition here because I think... It has a timeless quality about it in terms of everything, in terms of like the uh, subject matter is, you know, historical. It's got the incredible production that I think feels timeless. And yeah, it almost feels like an heirloom sort of game. So I think John Company will certainly be around in in 10 years. Man, this is tough. This is tough. Okay, back to me. I think I have to take this because I just, I can't see a world where it gets past Kellen. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I do think it's good. I think it's already timeless. It's already a game that practically comes out every single game night I go to. uh, And that is So Clover. Yeah. Excellent pick. Yeah, I was thinking about this. It could be a party. You know, a party game could be the only one on this list that's popular in 10 years. It could be. What a good game. Incredible game. This is like the quietest... Normally, we have these lists so <laughs> locked and loaded that we're just jeering each other the uh-huh. whole time. I think we're all in a mild state of panic right uh-huh. now as we try to predict 10 years from now. Mark's thinking about his will and testament. <laughs> and I have two picks now, huh? I want to take a flyer, you know what I mean? I want to believe in something so much that has been overlooked, underrated by the masses. And all I see on my list are like stuff that I've ranked even lower than BGG thinks they're <laughs> deserving to be. I have to pick twice? You have to pick twice. <laughs> oh, the laughter, I think, is about to start from the audience. <sighs> all right. With the first pick, I will pick Zuvatis. And the rationale here, right, like this game has existed for maybe like in another form for 10 years already in the form of Qua Vadis from 1992, almost before I was born. Zuvatis, I feel like, is a game that maybe hasn't reached its full potential in terms of mass distribution from the Kickstarter, in terms of people who are exposed to it. It is a negotiation game. For whatever reason, those simple rule sets feel like they could end up being timeless. I could see this existing on negotiation lists in the same way that Chinatown has for well over 10 years. It doesn't have the amount of votes, maybe, as some of these other ones. It is also just Reiner Knizia, who has some importance to the hobby and likely will for many years to come. But I don't know. I could be completely wrong here. Uh, I came into this draft with a short list of like potential games to draft, but every single pick has been on the list so far. So it's, <laughs> you know. it's like I want to use my fifth pick as the – this as is my killer. fourth pick. Yeah. I want to use it. The, you guys never saw it coming, <laughs> and I got you. You know what I mean? But it's so it's so tough, man. This is crazy. I'm stalling. How's my stalling going? <laughs> <laughs> this is hard. I love the <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. All right. I'm going to pick this just for the rage that it will cost Nealon. Station Fall, my fourth pick for this draft So the thinking here is that this is such a unique style of game, which is a very heavy, almost party-ish, narrative-driven, pseudo-social deduction game. Feels like something that will not come out very often. I could see this persisting on lists of people who just like this style of game and really lasting the test of time in terms of being a unique experience that you really can't get anywhere else. It is... Very niche. Not going to find this one in (laughs) Target, guys, but we're at the very tail end of this list. Stationfall feels to me like one of those special, unique ones. In my mind, I'm thinking of games like Battle for Rokugan or other stuff from the past. It's just like, you can't get that anywhere else. And then people go, oh, I really want that. I can see this being on everyone's sort of, I wish I had a copy of this 10 years from now. Stationfall, my fourth pick. 
certainly does not run the risk of a lot of these games where it just like is swallowed up by a bunch of other games that are like it. You know, it's not like another Midway Euro that you're just going to fall into. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Okay, back to me for my fourth pick. I am going to pick, this feels like a risk, but I'm, I'm going to pick Age of Innovation. So okay. the thinking here is that Gaia Project, in my opinion, is an improved version of Terra Mystica. Not everyone thinks that. Age of Innovation kind of feels to me a little bit like a good amalgamation of the two. It kind of feels like the direction that Terra Mystica, which if you think of as like an ongoing product, is evolving into. And it seems to me like the one that both Terra Mystica and Gaia Project fans are going to flock to in time. That's certainly my take. I think that's been a lot of people's take. For a lot of people that like both of those games, the, the degree to which they're raving about how good Age of Innovation is, is kind of remarkable. This feels like the one that's bringing the Terra Mystica audience all together they're pretty united in their love for this game so i think it's going to sort of be the long tail of the franchise i think it's going to supersede both terra mystica and gaia project as the definitive game in that franchise which to me just feels like it has the longevity yeah that's an interesting one right because it's sort of like it's often that the first one defines it and then the others People say, oh, it's an improvement, but you still, people end up, the, the first one being the one. So that will be an interesting one to know about in 10 years, like which of them survived. Yeah, I, and I could very much be wrong about oh, that. Oh, no, no, you no. Know, no. That, that's the crazy not, thing. It, it feels, like, it feels yeah. like a wild card to some extent, but that's how things feel right now. Like, you know, I don't necessarily have my hands on the pulse of that community, which does feel like its own little niche in board games to some extent, but that does feel a little bit to me like where the winds are going on the product. Yeah, I mean, and I think that, you know, this speaks like... The fact that we're struggling this hard to even get to 15 yeah. games, not, not we're not like, like that could be relevant, says something about the hobby, I feel like, guys. I feel like we're touching something. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been talking about how hard it is to make picks for this draft, and I, I agree with that. But I will say that after I made my last pick, I looked at my list. And I put four little check marks beside four little games. And I said, if any of these come through, I'm going to draft them. And I'll, I'm happy to report that all four oh. survive. Interesting. So I'm left with another quandary. I, left, I thought I was going to have a quandary of lack of choice. And yet my quandary is one of too much choice and overabundance. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick for the, my fourth pick. I'm going to pick the game that I think, like Ark Nova, sort of feels like it is already starting to establish itself as a game that'll last. And this is going to be, it's sort of risky taking a two-player only game, I think, because of the number of people. But I think Caesar, Caesar Rome in 20 minutes, is a game that I see a lot of people playing when they're playing two-player games. Feels to me like among the best two-player games that has come out in the last three years. It already feels like when I was thinking about it, when I looked up the list, I had to check it again right now because I was like, did it come out earlier? Like I, I was convinced that it had come out before 2021 or 2022, whenever it came out. I thought it had been around for longer. And that's just a feeling I have whenever I see people play it. Like, it's always on tables. Whenever people are waiting for a game at a game night and there's just two of them, Caesar seems to be played a lot. So I'm going to go with Caesar, Caesar Roman 20 Minutes. So for my fifth pick, I'm going to take a newcomer, one that I'm banking on having the legs to stick around. And it's going to be one that, is fighting in a sort of a tough uh, arena because it's a midweight Euro and that's, it's an easily swallowable, swallowable, that's probably not the word I want to use, type of game considering so many games come out in that sort of weight. But I'm going to go with the White Castle, the latest Devere yeah. midweight Euro that seems to be getting a lot of buzz, seems to be soundly built. I've enjoyed my one play of it, but I've also enjoyed my plays of the other Devere small box midway games that I think all proven themselves to have longevity, like Three Ring Circus and Red Cathedral and Salt and Sea. But it seems to me that White Castle may be the cream of that crop. So I'm going to go with the White Castle for my last pick. It's a good game. I still want to do this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you would like it. Okay. I'm going to make my final pick. And this is like a sort of a heart pick for me a little bit. But I think it is also one that is kind of hard to imitate, hard to replicate, hard, kind of hard to replace. It is sort of a a lifer game to some extent. The people that love this game will continue to play this game for a very, 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 very long time. I don't suspect that there is going to be a Gods of Atlantis 3. So I'm going to choose Gods of Atlantis 2. 
I think that this is operating in a space that is so unique. It's a game that I personally adore, and it's a game that has a huge wealth of replayability and returnability and ability to like sort of come back to and improve your skill and watch it grow over time. And as much as that I had been playing Gods of Atlantis 1 since its original release, which is close to like 10 years ago now, and I still want to be playing more Gods of Atlantis 2, I think it's definitely stood the test of time to that extent. This is the, in my opinion, refinement of the system. I cannot see how you would improve upon it. That is Gods of Atlantis 2. It's not even something I had on my list, my short list, my backup list. I think it's funny. I think we're throwing less punches at each other because we know how painful this list is. Because we're all just sitting here going like, <laughs> like we're going to, who's going to get, get got here? And, and so it's an interesting pick. I would say the, I want to make a better MOBA board game feels like something that could be streamlined over time, whether it's Guards of Atlantis or some other game. That would be my question mark about it. I think that's but that's potentially true. I think I, I would I would right, no, that. and I'm not again, don't no. <laughs> don't take it for anything other than me thinking out loud to make it more interesting for viewers. All right, with the last pick, I love this because I can sort of think about two games live and then look at your faces to figure <laughs> out which ones strike fear into your hearts. One of them is Earth, which is a surprisingly popular game in the same realm as Ark Nova and terraforming Mars, but already a lot of reviews already in the top 200 on BGG. I can see with expansions, the longevity that this game could have it does feel like it has already crested its popularity run to some extent, um, but it remains to be seen. This came out last year and the other one is still on its upward trajectory. And this is sky team, which is a two player only thematic game about operating landing planes together this is already the 137th ranked game on board game geek after reviewing mark and neilan's faces i have selected sky team (laughs) with the last pick of the draft i see this one everywhere i see it on all the best of 2023 lists again there's a little bit of the flyer nature of this it's a game about flying and it could only go up from here. This could be the de facto two-player game that uh, could have a lot of legs in the mass market as well. A little concerned that my list overall is too light. Um, but again, since I'm hosting, I can beg the viewers to evaluate the list as they're supposed to and not based on uh, the games they like the best. Let so me just say something that... you're going to hate. Sure. I think of those two, you should have picked Earth. I'm, the, oh, I'm interesting. totally the other way. Oh, really? I, I, I would. I think Earth is a terrible pick. To be honest, fair. I don't like Earth all that much. Yeah, but I think yeah, I, Earth has longer legs than Sky Team, personally. Really? I mean, I don't know about the legs. Maybe the legs. There's something to be said for that, and I know that's what the we're legs. Sort of, yeah, that's what we're sort of talking about. But the thing is, like, I don't know. I don't know anybody who's, and I'm sure I'm wrong. And in fact, Delicio is a big fan of it. But I don't know. I don't, many people who are passionate about Earth. The thing is, these things come and go, right? And yeah. so it's like, there's a little bit of, I know in my mind where the Earth hype train is at, and I know the Sky Team train is at least still trending yeah. upward yeah. right yeah. now. You're, you're not wrong. And so there is a chance. But yeah. but again, I, I, you know, I was weighing both here. I, I think they're both, they're, they're both good picks of what, of what was left, to be fair. Yeah. So here is how this works as we wrap this up. You... The listener will go to boardgamebarrage.com slash vote, and you will vote on which list of five games you believe will still be relevant to the board game hobby in the year 2034. Neil and I will be around to evaluate this in the future state. Mark will not be with us anymore. Uh, Let me read you those games again. Mark's list, Ark Nova, Sea Salt and Paper, John Company 2nd Edition, Caesar sees Rome in 20 minutes and the White Castle. Neyland's list, Dune Imperium Uprising, Heat, Pedal to the Metal, So Clover, Age of Innovation, and Guards of Atlantis 2. Kellen's list, my list, Cascadia, Blood on the Clock Tower, Zoo Vadis, Station Fall, and Sky Team. 
So remember, go to boardgamebarrage.com slash vote. Vote for which list you think will be most relevant to the board game hobby in the year 2034. And you could win a $100 gift card to the online board game retailer of your choice. We do this to get more people listening to the episode. So tell your friends. They could win a gift card. They could come tell us how stupid we are. Come to boardgamebarrage.com slash disc um, to tell us how wrong we are and how obviously we should have picked... I don't know. Mission Deep Sea. Uh-huh. I don't know. Terraforming <laughs> Mars expansion. Like, f*** <laughs> off, okay? <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode of the Board Game Barrage podcast. You can find us in all forms of social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Discord. You can email us at boardgamebarrage at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Heart Society Music for their song, What's on Your Mind, Kid, from their album, Wake the Queens. They are no longer with us as well, but that <laughs> album will live on for. Ever. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Good evening and good night. Bye bye.